Hi, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. And I have a very exciting interview for you today. I will be speaking with Dominic Edwards, and he is the chair of the Trollope Society, which just knowing kind of the wonderful uh, array of plots and characters that are in Trollope's novels, I feel like it is a literary society I would very much want to be a part of if I lived in England. Uh, so Dominic, thank you for being willing to take the time to speak with me. It's a pleasure and a delight. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so before we talk specifically about Anthony Trollope, I thought it would be interesting to kind of get a background on how you came to love Victorian literature. Was it through school or through kind of your library at home or how did you get yeah. to know it better? Well, that's a really good question because I think I've always read, I've never read modern literature. I think probably because of like the library at home well library is a grand word the book the books at home i started my earliest memory of reading is is actually sherlock holmes so that's sort of oh. late victorian mm -hmm. so i devoured sherlock holmes from the age of eight i went on to sort of jules verne and hg wells and then later on sort of met uh the, the met you know mrs gaskell and, and and all of the victorian authors so um i've sort of um always been, it feels to me, as a, uh, a, a Victorian or, or, or Victorian early 20th century reader. Yeah. That's lovely. And um, what do you think it is about Victorian literature that stands out to you, that keeps you reading more and more? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's, I think for me, it's the, it's actually the publishing techniques. It's the three decker. It's the fact that uh, through either serialization or, 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 or books in, in part, um, we got this wonderful three decker, which is translates to about 800 pages. And in a three decker, whether it be uh, George Eliot or Mrs. Gaskell, whether it be Wilkie Collins or Charles Dickens, there's room for expansion. And I think that's what I like. I like becoming absolutely involved in the world of that book. And it depends on the author. So Dickens is going to be the extraordinary plot and the unbelievable characters and the, the humour and the larger than life um, experience of reading it. For Trollope, it's the intimate understanding of the psychology of the characters. It's their depth and their reality, which for me is so involving. And I think involving is the word. I find that with a with a novel of um of, of that length, you have time, and the author has room to involve the reader in a way that a short kind of you know two hundred page novel just can't do. And um, that I think is the attraction for me. So for me, it's 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 the length of the three decker. Now, if you happen to pick a Victorian author who uh, who um, is not in the top flight then that three-decker can be a challenge. And I have read some Disraeli where you think, I wish this wasn't a three-decker. So you do need to pick a good, a good one. But if you pick a good one, you get, it, you get so involved uh, in the experience of the novel. Mm. Yeah, my dad is an English teacher and he says he remembers when assigning, uh, or he's a retired English teacher, when uh, assigning novels for people to read, they would say, you know, how long, how long is it? And he said, <laughs> well, I could give you a, a 30 page phone book and you would be bored to tears. Um, yeah. So the length it is, does not it be is. a reason why you would or wouldn't read it. No, and I think, I mean, quite often people with Trollope want a, a short read and it's like actually that's not what it's about. So there's two ways of looking at this. First of all, cost per word is very low on an 800 page novel. So you're That's a very good it. point. <laughs> and secondly, it's not a race to finish it. It doesn't matter if it takes you a month to read the book. Um, it, it, it's not a kind of a, a race to move on to the next one. So I would say, throw yourself into it, become involved and enjoy it. And um, and it doesn't matter whether, if you know, really if it's, if, if it's, if it's only 200 pages, really, how are they going to, how are you going to really get anything worth it in, in such a short novel? Go for the, go for the three decker and that will be an experience like no other. Yeah, the reward is going to be very different than a 200 page novel. Um, and so then are there any Victorian novels that kind of stick out to you as you don't hear them spoken about nearly as much as David Copperfield or mm -hmm. Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights that you think are underrated? Absolutely. I mean, I think 
you know, it's wonderful actually that say that the media returned to some of the kind of the favourites like like David, as you said, like like Dickens and Bronte, and that's that's wonderful. But there are so many others, so many others, um, and um, actually Trollope does a pretty good um, appraisal of his contemporaries in the autobiography. He references. Uh, uh, Jane Austen, who's obviously a wee bit earlier, but he references Jane Austen, he talks about Wilkie Collins, obviously he talks about Charles Dickens, he talks about George Eliot, and he's very observant and says, you know, George Eliot's works, his works are, you know, exquisite and beautiful pieces of art, but he asks what young person would read them for entertainment? So, um, he, you know, th those, those are the, the issues. For me, as chair of the Trollope Society, Trollope is underrated. And that's really the mission of the Trollope Society to ensure that he doesn't go the same way as, for instance, his mother, Fanny Trollope, who very few people read now. Um, he's far superior to Fanny Trollope, I would say, but it's so easy for us to um, concentrate just on the, the, the Brontes, Dickens um, and, and Eliot. And there's so much more. Uh, Mrs. Gaskell and, uh, and Trollope, for instance, are people who it would be an enormous cultural loss if we if we were to lose them. Mm. Yeah, there really is. There was, I don't know, something in the in the air <laughs> in the 19th century in England among the authors. It was just a really special time for literature. I mean, I think really it was it was we have to think, you know, authors don't exist without the publishers and it was the publishing technique. So, mm. you know, they were bringing uh, reading to a, a mass market for the first time. They were developing techniques, which we still have today. The serialization was a really important technique because a novel, to purchase a three volume novel was, was you know, very expensive. And um, there were other ways. So, so by uh, using serialization, you could just quickly pick out a novel um, from WH Smith set the railway station. Um, uh, or you could subscribe to Household Words or Fortnightly mm -hmm. Review, and you would get, you know, the great, the great authors of the day. But it would take you, you would be reading, you know, several novels at, at the same time over the period of maybe a year or more. So, mm -hmm. you know, really to read a to read a novel, to to read to read the whole of the Eustace Diamonds, which is you know, 700 pages. That is the equivalent of binging on Netflix, because most people would have read it in part every month over a year and a half. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, it's uh, how we think about consuming novels is very different. And then were circulating libraries a big part of people consuming novels as well or? Absolutely. And Moody's, I don't know if you know about, I'm sure you've heard of Moody's, the big, the biggest and the most, the most successful of circulating libraries. And actually, if you don't, if you, if you just indulge me, I have a lovely quote about Trollope from Moody's, oh, yeah. which relates to Trollope and Moody's. So Moody's was the, the Netflix of the day. People subscribed to Moody, Moody's and they got the latest and the best novels available to them in their circulating library. And one of the, uh, the greatest, uh, this is how Trollope, Trollope was very successful with circulating libraries. And we have to remember that Trollope was writing to sell books. That was his focus. His mother, you know, the family were, had had, had to flee Britain uh, to Belgium because they were um, broke and had to escape debtors prison. He was mm -hmm. always very aware of money and he wrote in order to make money. So this is a quote which is from the Times and it relates to, it's a, it's a, uh, a review of the Bertrams. And it says, if Moody were asked who is the greatest living man of men, he would without a moment's hesitation say Anthony Trollope. This majestic personage with uh, whom authors worship and whom readers court knows that at present, one writer in England is paramount above all others and his name is Trollope. He is at the top of the tree. He stands alone. Um, there is nobody to be compared with him. He writes faster than we can read. And the more that the pensive public reads, the more that it desires to read. Mr. Anthony Trollope is in fact, the most fertile, the most popular, the most successful author, that is to say, of the circulating library. <laughs> 
And that's such a Trollopian comment because Trollope loves to do that, build people up and then knock them down at the last minute. And this really is one of the problems that the Trollope Society has. Right from the beginning, from the contemporary reviews back in um, you know, the 1860s, people recognize that Trollope entertained and he entertains wonderfully. His language is so lucid, his characters are so real, his plots are so, so enjoyable that people, I think, have dismissed him as what we might describe. I used to work in a bookshop and we had a, a table which we called airport fiction. He's not airport fiction. There is much more to Trollope. And in fact, what's, what, what's wonderful is Oxford University Press and, and other um, publishers have over the last decade or so, you know, got new editors, great new editors to uh, re-examine re -examine Trollope and, and finds, you know, there's so much more. He is multi-layered, he is complex, and he does have something to say. And I think for me as a reader, the thing that he most has to say is how we should live our lives. And it's an eternal and perennial question which transcends time. And it's a question which all of Trollope novels ask, how should we live our lives? What is a good life? Um, and what is really, Practical morality is, is what he's exploring, but he does it with uh, a lightness and an understanding of everybody. So I'm sure that you'll be aware that lots of Trollope fans will say, you know, in Trollope, there is no black and white. Everything is shaded. He's, he's not like Dickens. There are no characters like Fagin. Everybody, he understands and he seeks to understand. And by reading him, not only is it a pleasurable experience, I feel that it teaches, well, it teaches me, and that's all I can speak of, really to try and understand other people, to understand mm -hmm. humanity, to be more generous than you would otherwise be. And he is a generous and kind man. And I think that's what comes across and is one of the attractions of reading him. Yeah, he does feel very fond of his readers as um, as you're reading, you know, and fond of his characters. Um, yes. Yeah, he does. He just seems to be a very generous author. And there hasn't been a book of his that I've read, which I've read only 10. And in the modern day, if you said only 10 of a modern author, that mm -hmm. would be outrageous. But for trial, it is only. Um, but I wish I'd only read 10 because you've got 37 more to read. Yes, I'm in for uh, a lot of treats, uh, but there hasn't been one of those that I haven't seen myself in at least one of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that, you know, just the experience of being human, it doesn't matter if you're living current day or if you're living in the 19th century. Um, it's all these Absolutely, questions. They, his characters, you know, are, you know, whether we have Zoom or, or, or we're still the same people. Mm -hmm. um, and I would be interested to know, you know, as a as a as someone who's who's read Trollope, I'd ask you. you know, for me, one of the attractions is the connection with the author, and unusually, mm -hmm. he has the authorial voices present in Trollope, and he brings the reader into his confidence. I don't know if you feel that that is something which is attractive. I think it, it's a difficult thing to pull off, and some people find it interrupts the narrative. But for me, it brings you closer to the author. Oh yeah, I love it. I feel like it's kind of a bit like you're watching a play and the playwright is sitting next to you and says, oh, you know, this next scene, I put it in because. So you yeah. can get kind of some background information. And also I loved, I can't remember, I think it's in uh, Dr. Thorne, the whole chapter about the, the young man who is a hobbledehoy. Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> which, which is very autobiographical, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know this. Um, yes, no, he, he, he famously, he, he had a miserable childhood, absolutely wretched. His mother, Aww. you know, his mother went off to America with another man, left him, his father, who I think today would be um, diagnosed with manic depression, ha wow. left his father with poor Anthony. He had this dreadful walk to school. And when he was at school, he was mercilessly bullied. And when he came home, he had his sort of manic depressive father. So this period, this walk to school, what he did was he created characters and he gave them their characteristics and he would put them into situations. And what he says in the autobiography is he will just see what happens. 
And that's why in his novels, his characters are so believable because they never step outside what their character, their character would do. They always operate within the bounds of their personalities. Um, and actually Nathaniel Hawthorne said that reading a Trollope novel is, is like looking under a glass dome at a world in which the inhabitants are going about their business without knowing that they're being observed. So for me, it's like the Truman Show. That's what, that's what reading a Trollope is like. The characters are just living their lives and we're watching them and they don't know that we're watching them. And I, and I love, they have this kind of uh, slice of life feel. And, and I don't mean that to me, uh, I mean that they are less deep than they are. But I really love novels where you feel like you are um, almost real time with the characters. You yeah. know, here's what they're doing this day, and then we're going to yeah. hang out with them more tomorrow, just well, to I see think, events slowly unfold. I um, think that, that that's another aspect of Trollope, which is slightly different to many other Victorian novelists, certainly different to Dickens and Eliot. Mm. Uh, the, the, the convention was to predate novels by maybe 20 or 30 years. Certainly that's what um, uh, uh, George Eliot was doing in things like Mill on the Floss. It's slightly predated. Trollope is absolutely today. This is happening today, and we are following them now. And I think that that's you know that 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 that's a very important factor, and something which is quite hard to understand when we're reading it because uh, we don't know what was kind of current at the time. But Trollope was talking about current issues. So, for instance, The Warden, which is obviously where lots of people start, The Warden is really is about a scandal, which is a real scandal that people will have known about, about misappropriation of funds in a charitable mm. institution. So people will have known, oh, that's what he's referring to. This happened like just, you know, just now. And in fact, there's one novel which is a wonderful novel and it's worth reading irrespective of, of this, this story I'm going to tell, which is called Is He Popenjoy? And it's to do with the whether or not a character is the legitimate son of, 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 of um, uh, a member of the aristocracy and therefore entitled to inherit. Now, the thing was that this was being written in series precisely in tandem with the biggest court case of the Victorian period in civil court, which was called the Tichborne Claimant. That you may have, there, there's a film with Stephen Fry called The Tichborne Claimant. Oh. The Tichborne Claimant was a real story where somebody rocked up from Australia and said, I am the heir to you know, the Tichborne fortune. And there was a court case to determine, was he, the Tich, is the Tichborne Claimant the, the legitimate heir? And Trollope in tandem wrote, is he Popenjoy? And everyone would have realized that this was a cause celeb. It was a biggest court case. Unfortunately, it was the longest court case of the Victorian period. And what happened was the court case hadn't finished and Trollope had to get on the Great Britain, SS Great Britain to go to Australia. And he had to finish the novel before the court case finished. So he oh. sort of budges it a little bit, but I won't give you give away the ending because it really is, you do need to read the book to find out, is he pop and joy? That is fabulous. So then what was your um, introduction into Anthony Trollope? Do you remember where you yes, started? I do. Well, it, when I, um, I, uh, I studied uh, philosophy in, in Scotland and after doing my philosophy degree, I thought, what can I do? And the answer was pretty much nothing. So, <laughs> so I, um, I came to London and I got a job in Waterstones in Kensington High Street, which is one of the kind of most uh, sort of poshest areas of London. It's a beautiful bookshop in a beautiful area. Anyway, it turns out that Penguin Books were headquartered just down the road. So the Penguin book rep was an absolutely lovely man and he would come in to Waterstones. And at that time, Penguin just published uh, the complete Anthony Trollope in paperback. And he used to give, not just me, but everybody in the bookshop, you know, copies of, of Trollope because he loved Trollope. And so at one point, the whole bookshop, I don't know, 30 members of staff were all reading Barchester Towers. Oh. And I, um, I just went on to read them. And I didn't really think about it because I was reading Trollope, I was reading Dickens, I was reading Eliot, I was reading Mrs. Gaskell. But I kept returning to Trollope. And it, then after you know, several years, I kind of realised, you know, Trollope is something really extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I began to read all of them and found that there are 47 and you can really keep going for quite a long time. 
<laughs> so I, I owe um, I, I owe a debt of thanks to ping to the Penguin uh, book sales rep uh, for for the London area um, who introduced me to Trollop. That is a fabulous story. I just love like here, at, you know, being like a Trollope evangelist. <laughs> Here's this fabulous author. You must read him. And I mean, if you're going to get anyone to read read him, it would be people in a book working in a bookshop. They'll be yeah. the most open to it. Um, so then I guess thinking about you've touched on this a little bit, but Trollope compared to his contemporaries, what do you think it is in particular that makes him stand out? Well. I mean, I think there, 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 there are several things. I think the, the main thing is that, first of all, he's a realist. Um, he's primarily a realist and he's celebrated for being, you know, incredibly real, re uh, realist. And he, he writes to George Eliot and he so, sort of says, congratulations on Romola, you know, well done, great work of art. I'm quite pleased with my little book, Rachel Ray, because nothing happens out of the ordinary. Nothing happens that wouldn't happen in real life. So he was, he was a realist, but actually, We've just been reading this year because it's the 150th anniversary of the Eustace Diamonds, and Professor Helen Smallwood has pointed out that this is this is pretty much a sensation novel. Mm. Um, it's got a lot of the the kind of ingredients of a sensation novel, and some of the characters are are really quite two dimensional, cartoonish in a, in the way of a sensation novel. So although he was a, a realist, he was also aware of you know the market at the time. So for me there are two things which really stand out and i think i think they're probably what trollope would want the first thing is the characterization as i've mentioned his characters are wonderfully real i mean it, it's extraordinary that they're not real people and you build a relationship with them because in the palace series you uh you 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 know glencora and plantagenet um over six books but they also appear in two novels in the previous series, the Barsetshire series. So there's room, as I say, to get to know these characters and they all have flaws and they mm. all have faults and none of them are good and none of them are bad and they are therefore real. And I think this is, there's a certain degree of maturity that's required to read Trollope because you're not going to find characters who are good or bad. You're going to find characters who are flawed and mm. they're flawed in a way which real real people are flawed. So mm. for, for me, it's the characterization, um, and the and the and the second thing is the relationship with the author, as you've mentioned. The kind of when he takes you aside and he says, "Now look, don't worry, because you know Eleanor Bold is not going to marry Mister Slope, but the archdeacon <laughs> doesn't know that. So let's just see what happens." So it's that sort of confidence he he has he has been in the in the reader, and actually, it's a confidence in his writing. Um, in and I'll try not to give away the plot in case people haven't read it, but in one of his greatest novels, Orley Farm, uh, that turns on a court case and it's a really, it's an extraordinary and wonderful novel. But halfway through the book, less than halfway through, he tells the reader what the, what the court, what the, you know, whether the, ah. whether the accused does it or not. He's in a way showing off. He's almost saying, look, I don't need to rely on that suspense. I can tell you, you and I now know whether this person did what they're accused of or not, but let's just see what unfolds. And I think that that is something which brings you close to the author. Um, he, he tells you about the plot and sometimes he tells you what he's thinking. Sometimes he literally says, I'm cudgeling my brain. I've got to write you know, five more chapters and I don't know what to do. Or sometimes he'll say, look, it's very popular. There's this thing called, in, I think it's called in Medea Ray or something, which is to throw yourself in. He said, you know, I could say someone throw, someone falls out the window straight away and you'd be gripped, but I'd have to go back and I'd have to say who it was that threw out the window. I'd have to tell you why they were thrown out the window. I'd have to tell you who it was that threw out the window. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to introduce you to our characters. Just stick with me and then we'll get on with our story. And so mm. it's that sort of closeness where he's actually telling you how he's constructing the novel. That is lovely. And then also, I think um, his career can be encouraging to those who might not be um, working with uh, their day job might not be what they're passionate about, uh, because wasn't he, he was a postman? Well, he, what happened, because he had, um, because the family fled to Bruges when they lost all their money and they would have had to go to debtor's prison, he couldn't go to, to Oxford. 
So his mother mm. kind of pulled some strings. She had some connections in the post office and he got a job in, uh, it was called, it was, it was kind of the headquarters of the post office. He was just, a, he was a clerk. And actually he wrote one of his first novels or earlier novels, The Three Clerks is really about his experience in the post office. Um, he was wretched and miserable and didn't do well. And he didn't get on with his boss, Maybelli. He was mm. eventually sent to Ireland. And when he went to Ireland, two things happened. He met his, he, 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 he married, but he began to write. And he wrote his first novel, The McDermott's of Ballycloran. He's in his mid forties by this point. Wow. And he really found his, his place in life. Um, and so that's really encouraging. He actually loved the post office. He then became very senior in the post office. He toured the south and um, southwest of England and introduced the post box to Britain. It had already appeared in Paris, but he introduced the post box under his recommendation. Uh, it was introduced and they're actually uh, in the first five post boxes in London. There are Anthony Trollope plaques on them. Wow. But he also he, he went across the whole world. He, he was an in incredible traveller. He went all around the world. In fact, this this post this um this is from a conference we had a few years ago called worldwide trollope um and he negotiated postal treaties throughout from britain all the way to australia uh with with all the countries en route uh including negotiating with the kind of the pasha in egypt um the route through egypt prior to the suez canal so he had this extraordinary other life as a post office he was actually a very high ranking official at the post office by the time he retired. And what he did was he was overlooked. Roland Hill was the giant of the post office. He invented, he started the Penny Black, which was the first, you know, prepaid postage stamp. Mm. Um, when Roland Hill, Hill retired, um, Trollope was really hoping to become maybe postmaster general. And he was overlooked because he felt they thought, you've got this writing career, the post office isn't your focus. You, you don't need the money. And he was very hurt by that. And he retired or left the post office uh, with I think something like 35 years service, which meant he didn't get a penny. He got no pension. Uh, he, he worked there for 35 years and got nothing when he left. But what that gave us was more room and time for him to, to write novels. So for us, it's good he left the post office. Um, and I think whilst he worked there, he genuinely loved it. And when you read, Trollope, there's always, there are always letters going to him. They're always part of the plot. And in some of his novels, I think in Family Passage, he describes the route the letter takes and it goes up the upline and it waits at a sorting office and then it doesn't get delivered because of something or other. He loves the technicality of how letters were delivered. Um, mm. And for us today, it's hard to understand the, um, the impact that the post office had on on people's lives because essentially in London there were four deliveries a day so you could wow. you could you could send a letter in the morning and easily get a reply by the afternoon it's pretty much like email and also for women in particular it freed them because they could just drop a letter in that post box um, and it meant that they had the freedom of communication which they'd never had before mm. And then he had a relatively happy marriage. Well, we don't know very much about his marriage um, to Rose. Um, he, in his autobiography, doesn't give away any, any details at all about his personal life. We know that later on in life, she, Rose copied out his manuscripts. Um, before, and, then, and, then, and then I think Bice, his niece, did. did. So she was involved in, in supporting his work. Um, um, but we don't really know very much about about Rose or about his relations with her. Um, he he um, he really kept his private life private. Hmm. Um, so then I'm thinking when I'm speaking with you know your average reader who has dipped their toes a bit into Victorian literature, if I say you know I'm reading a Charles Dickens, they know. I'm reading a Bronte, they know. Um, sometimes with George Eliot, uh, but with Trollope, I kind of get who. You know who is that, and um, and so what is kind of the general consensus on why he might not be as much of a household word? Mm. Well, at the at the time, he really was 
you know, at the time of publication, he was top flight. And, you know, after, <laughs> I like to say that he outsold Dickens, but he only outsold Dickens after Dickens died. But nonetheless, <laughs> he was, you know, the doyen, as we've heard of the circulating library, hugely popular. And he's really had a couple of periods where he was very popular in the Second World War uh, because people, interestingly, reached to him kind of for comfort reading. And he's been popular in lockdown. But actually, he's not comfort reading. He's quite challenging. Um, I think the reason he's probably not as well known as Dickens and Eliot is because he's not studied at school. And he's not studied at school because he's deceptively simple, because he was writing to entertain. And therefore, people think that he's perhaps not worth the uh, study. But he really he, he is. And he is multi-layered. And there are endless and numerous references to both you know, uh, the Bible, to Greek uh, history, to you know, there's so many layers, but um, he's seen as, I think, um, too populist and too simple. And that means that people don't um, study him at school. Now, if you were at school, I probably, I didn't enormously enjoy uh, re being introduced to, to, I don't know, George Eliot at school. I think we read Mill on the Floss, but I've subsequently returned to Mill on the Floss and loved it. And I think the issue is people aren't introduced to him at school. So mm. that's, that's why he's 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 not as popular as those authors who have, you know, you know, well, century now of of school introducing them to, to pupils. So um what's interesting is everybody has a story as to how they met and 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 started reading Trollope. So mine mine is attached to my bookshop. What how did you've read 10? How how were you attracted to Trollope? And I assume you weren't introduced to him at school, so you must have found him some other way. Yeah, I had um, not, I feel like an, maybe uh, not many readers I know start with The Way We Live Now, but that was the Ooh, one yeah. that I started with. And my aunt, who is a huge bibliophile and um, you know reads everything from Trollope to uh, kind of your, I don't know, like mass market paperback bestsellers. Um, and I was newer at reading Victorian literature. So it was not a smashing success. Um, I did enjoy it. And I thought that was a very good book. I more appreciated it, um, which I'm generally fine with most classics if that's how I feel because they'll stay with you then. Uh, but it was when I got to the third and the Barsetshire. So Dr. Thorne was when, oh boy, you know, Trollope, you have a, you have a bit of my heart now. Oh, <laughs> good. Yes. I mean, that's an interesting one because some people say if Trollope had only written The Way We Live Now, he'd be more famous because that would be a lot of people regard The Way We Live Now. First of all, it's the title. I mean, he came up with the, the title everyone would want. So it's this great title. But um, people saying if he read The Way We Live Now, uh, he, he perhaps would be more famous. The problem is there are so many, it's hard to find your way in. The way we live now is an interesting one. We read it recently in, in lockdown um, on mm -hmm. Zoom. And um, one of the things which I hadn't, one of the good things about Trollope is they bear rereading because it depends on what's happening in your own life as to what you get out of them. But for me, one of the observations was that um, for, instead of it being this great sort of state of the nation novel, you know, it really is about the characters. It's about the, its characterization and the backdrop is the world of financial corruption. And mm. I think if you approach it with that view that it's about the characters, these extraordinary characters, um, and, and this is the world they inhabit, then you will enjoy it more. If you're trying to look for some great message, then I think you're, you, you're seeking something and, and almost missing the, the novel itself. So again, it's for me, whatever he's writing, the, the characters are the, pe are the for me, the, 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 the attraction. And in the way we live now, he has some really extraordinary characters. Melmot's an extraordinary character, but there are moments, despite the fact that Melmot is dishonest and um, um, brutal, where we have real sympathy for him and for his plight. Yes. Um, and I think that is what I mean when I say it helps us in life, because there are some people who are coarse and crude and, and apparently brutal, but they are still people. And, and I think that it, it, that's what Trollope tells us, that you mm -hmm. know, he, he understands humanity and he asks us to do the same.
Yeah, yeah. Um, so then if a reader says to you, where should I start with Trollope? Which they often do. <laughs> which they often, I'm sure they do. So a short well, story, a book. I, I would say he, he did write, he wrote lots of short stories. And there are many Trollope readers who love his short stories. I have to say, I'm not one of them. Um, his short stories, because you need room for characterization, and because he said, you know, a plot is just the vehicle for the characters, short stories are really dependent on, on plot and they need to be crafted very tightly. So some of Tro Tro Trollope's short stories are not terribly exciting. But there's one who, there's one short story in, he had a collection called Tales of All Countries and the, um, the kind of headline story in that is a story called Why Frau Froman Raised Her Prices, which is the story of a hotelier who finds that the cost of her food and supplies are going up, so she decides to raise her prices. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I'm not sure that that's quite on. You know, he 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 doesn't. He, his his style doesn't for me short suit short story. So I would say go for a three decker, and for me the one to go for, um, and there are so many, and many of his are wonderful. Mm -hmm. I would go for Barchester Towers. I would miss the warden which you can mm -hmm. come back to. The Warden is delightful. Barchester Towers, for me, it's, it's laugh out loud funny. Mm -hmm. um, it has a wonderful cast of characters. They are absolutely at loggerheads and you have the kind of the fighting which Trollope novels always have between characters. Um, and it's just good fun. Queen Victoria loved it and I love it. <sighs> That's so fun to know that Queen Victoria loved it. <laughs> she wrote to I can't remember the exact quote but I think she wrote to her sister and said I'm reading Barchester Towers it's it's great fun it's a bit naughty isn't it sort of thing um he loved it <laughs> and it is in it is it's readable it's fun and once you've read Barchester Towers you kind of get the flavor of Trollope and you you'll no no doubt go on to read read others so I I always say start with Barchester Towers. And if you don't like Barchester Towers, you won't like Trollope. If you do like Barchester Towers, you've got a whole world of Trollope mm. to go for. Yes, it's a good litmus test then. Yes. <laughs> and then um, favorite Trollope novel. I know it's like choosing your favorite child. Um. <laughs> so, and I have to say, oh, it's so difficult. I might, it might be easier to say the ones I'm, I'm less keen on. I have to say, we've just read The Eustace Diamonds mm -hmm. and it was great. I loved every page of it. I've read it probably three or four times. Um, this time it was better than ever. It's got better in the last 10 years. Oh. Somehow. Um, it's great fun. And especially it's kind of, it's, it's written uh, after Dickens had died. It's written after Wilkie Collins had 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 the you know, phenomenal success of Woman in White, so it has some flavour of sensation mm -hmm. about it. You know, it's got diamonds, it's got a beautiful woman, it's got chases, it's got crime, it's got policemen. It's an absolutely ripping read. So um, uh, I would say read Barchester Towers and then reach for the Eustace Diamonds, and you'll then be hooked. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then any kind of uh, anecdotes or bits from Trollope's life that just make you smile are fun to think about? Well, I mean, he, the, the main thing about him was Trollope was, he was a straightforward chap. He, he, he was larger than life. He had a huge sort of, he was, you know, he was quite fat and quite jolly, but he wrote these very sensitive novels. Um, I think you know the the stories which everyone comes out with are that he he you know he paid a servant to wake him up at five a.m. so that he would write for three hours um, before going to work to in the post office. So he would write at five a.m. He would write for three hours, but he didn't sit there chewing his pencil. He wrote two hundred and fifty words every fifteen minutes, and he churned them out. And that, for me, is what we can learn from him. That he says, you know, the um. A, I can't remember the exact quote, but basically it's a small task daily repeated will beat the labours of Hercules. And for me, that's mm -hmm. what we can take away from Trollope. If you really put your mind to something and you stick at it, you can achieve it. Mm. Yeah, that is, wow, it's inspiring. Yes, he is inspiring, yes. 
Um, and so then thinking about the Trollope Society, how did you come to be a part of it and work your way up to being the chair of the Trollope Society? <laughs> well, uh, as I say, I started reading Trollope at the bookshop. Um, I read all of Trollope and I thought, mm, you know, there's a Trollope Society. And um, uh, I, I was a little bit tentative about joining, but I joined the Trollope Society and the first event I went to was a garden party. And it said on the invitation, that it was um, fancy dress. So I went to uh, a professional costumier for the stage and I got the authentic garb of a mid 19th century high church dignitary uh, and oh. went in the character of the Archdeacon, Archdeacon Grantley from Barchester Towers. Oh and that had a shovel hat uh, and gaiters and a stock and that, Anyway, I got there at this beautiful garden party. I was the only person in fancy dress. <laughs> so everyone remembers the entrance, but the hilarious thing is nobody says, oh, I remember when you turned up at the Trollope Society, you rocked up dressed as the Archdeacon. They all say I was dressed as Mr. Slope. <laughs> now, nobody would want to go anywhere in the character of Mr. Slope, but... Um, that is how I'm remembered. So I'm remembered as appearing at the Trollope Society, dressed as Mr. Slope. Now, actually, if you know your mid 19th century clerical garb, Mr. Slope was low church and he would never have worn the outfit mm. that I was wearing. That's clearly a high churchman. But um, uh, that, that, that uh, was not noticed. So I'm well known for appearing in the garb of Mr. Slope. Um, and really, I just, it was a wonderful committee. It's a wonderful society. Um, I, I, my, in my, professional life I work for another charity in communication so I've sort of brought that to the Trollope Society so we've got a, a very good website and I would recommend anyone who's interested in Trollope to visit trollopesociety.org uh, and it's a great website it's got over what it's got the details of over one and a half thousand characters all 47 novels everything you could ever want to know about Trollope is all there um, and so that's really been my sort of um uh, uh, a project over many years and then um, wow. I had the opportunity to become the chair and I'm very uh, delighted and honoured to be the chair but for me the most important thing and the purpose it is a charity it's not just a sort of a membership group the purpose the charitable purpose of the Trollope Society is to uh, to uh, it, uh, to uh, to get people to read Trollope and to ensure mm -hmm. that Trollope doesn't go the way of um, of his mother, of, Ms. of Fanny Trollope, um, and ensure that Trollope continues to be read for future generations. And that's the mission of the Trollope Society. Um, and I believe it's very important because I think we would be culturally impoverished if we were to lose Trollope and also other authors. And there are many other societies, you know, kind of flying the flag for their author as well. And so, um, uh, um, that that that's that that that's wonderful, wonderful. But for me, it's it's flying the flag for Trollope. I love it. And then, do you have any events that the Trollope Society has hosted that particularly are fond memories for you? Yes. Well, apart from turning up at a at a fancy dress um, garden party, um, we just had this year. I mean, just not even this year, just last month. So it's most kind of it's foremost in my mind. An absolutely wonderful dinner at the Reform Club. So Phineas Finn, who is a central character in the Palliser novels, was a member, fictional member of the Reform Club, uh, which is a gentleman's club in, in, in central London, and it's absolutely beautiful. We had a dinner there in July to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Eustace Diamonds. And uh, we have some really, we're very fortunate, we have some wonderful um, patrons, we call them vice presidents, but essentially they're patrons. Uh, John Major, the, um, the, the, the Prime Minister of, of the UK from the 1990s, is a, uh, a vice president. And he's really instrumental in setting up the Trollope Society because when he was Prime Minister, he was on Desert Island Discs, a big Radio 4 programme, and he lamented that Trollope wasn't in print. And that was mm -hmm. the reason the Trollope Society was set up. So John Major has been a wonderful supporter of Trollope. Uh, for many years, and he really knows his Trollope. He's, 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 he knows, he's got a pretty encyclopedic knowledge of Trollope. But we also have other wonderful um, patrons, Susan Hampshire, who many people will know from 
the 1970s version of the Palliser series, and she also played um, Madeleine Neroni in the Barchester Chronicles with um, with with with, with um, Nigel Hawthorne as the Archdeacon. Oh. Uh, she's a, a long-standing and wonderful supporter, and we, we we she attended this dinner. So we had a beautiful dinner with lots of um, uh, luminaries from the Trollope world uh, just last month in the in in the Reform Club. So that was a really special and lovely um, uh, dinner, in particular because we haven't been able to meet or hold events for obviously you know the last couple of years in lockdown. So it was our first big event. And it, it was mm. very nice to return to physical events and seeing members um, enjoying themselves and talking about Trollope. That's lovely. And if you'd like to see, if you visit the website, you'll be able to see the photos from the evening. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. And then is there an upcoming Zoom discussion that will be hosted? Yes. So since lockdown, we've been reading, what we do is we've been very fortunate because um, Oxford University Press uh, over the last sort of 10 years have republished with brand new, beautiful, beautifully set editions with wonderful new editors. And the editors have been incredibly generous. So uh, Professor Helen Small was the editor of Eustace Diamonds. She came to the dinner and she also oh. came to our Zoom meetings. Just on Monday, we started Can You Forgive Her, which is the first Excellent. in the Palace series. It's many people's favourites. It's a great novel. And we were delighted that Professor Dinah Shaw, uh, sorry, Professor Dinah Birch, um, who is the editor of the Can You Forgive Her Oxford World's Classics edition, introduced the novel. And what we do is we break the novel up into, uh, into two week chunks. And each week we read 14 chapters, so it's just one chapter a day. And at the end of the two weeks, we come together and discuss the chapters we've read. So mm -hmm. most novels take about six meetings uh, to read. Um, and then we have a meeting at the end where we discuss the whole novel. So we've had you know, hundreds and hundreds of people take part from all over the world joining our Zoom reading group. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been a real delight during lockdown. And we've continued it you know, now that we're able to have physical meetings, we're continuing our Zoom meetings. So all the details are on the website. If people um, want to join us, um, you can you can join. They'll, they'll, I'm about to publish next year's Zoom program um, on the website, so that will be available in the next few weeks. Oh, excellent! Well, uh, thank you, Dominic, so much for taking the time to speak with me, and I, I'm sure many watching are spurred on to explore more Trollope books, or if they haven't read him, to finally give it a go and try him for the first time. I hope so. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for indulging me on my, in my uh, uh, love of Trollope. Thank you very much, Kate. It's been a delight. Thank you.